off here. Um, I wanted to let you guys know what Ecomain is. Um, so we are a nonprofit. We're located over in Portland. Um, we are on Outer Congress over by Unum in 95. Um, and we are a um, quasi-municipal organization that's owned by 20 municipalities. Um, and we manage municipal solid waste and recycling. Um, so in addition to those 20 owner communities, we also have around 50 organization or um, sorry towns um, that will contract with us to either take their recycling their trash or both um, and those communities are located all over Maine um, or the um, yeah we're, we're located all over Maine <laughs> so we do have three facilities um, and those help us manage the trash and recycling that we get from around a third of Maine residents. So um, over at our waste to energy facility, we get approximately 175 tons of trash a year. Um, and we use our waste to energy facility to combust that trash, turn it into ash and take it over to our ash fill um, where it's stored. And then we also get 35,000 tons of recycling every year, um, which we're gonna dive right into today. So before we had this waste energy and recycling technology, all of this waste that we create um, through our day-to-day -day lives, we're going into landfills. So as you can imagine, and I'm sure you guys have heard about before, landfills aren't great. Um, they occupy really valuable land, a lot of times thousands or hundreds of acres, depending on where you live. Um, and through the process of decomposition, um, the waste that are in the landfills release harmful methane gases, um, which are of course really toxic to our atmosphere and um, us as humans. Um, but what's great is when we combust our trash, like we do over here at EcoMain, um, the product that we are putting into the ash fill, the ash itself, um, does not release any methane gases or anything like that because it's already um, been through the decomposition process, which was sped up really quickly by um, the combustion. So um, that there are ways that we can avoid these harmful effects of landfills. Um, and one of those ways is through recycling. Um, so any amount of waste that we can keep out of a landfill um, is of course really helpful and beneficial to us um, as a whole state and community um, throughout Maine. Let's see. So um, to jump into our timeline really quickly, I wanted to let you guys know how we got to do what we do here at EcoMaine. Um, so in the late 70s, Portland, South Portland, and Scarborough and Cape Elizabeth were all using their own landfills um, that were for their individual towns, which were smaller. Um, but they decided to join forces and um, open a landfill for all of them. Um, so this is the 240 acre landfill that we still have today. Um, and at the time, they named themselves Regional Waste Systems. And in the 80s, they expanded to 20 municipalities, which are still our owner communities today. Um, and the, the late 80s, they built our waste energy facility to help reduce the amount of waste that was getting put into the landfill and extend the life of that landfill. Um, so we were also able to use the combustion of trash through our waste energy facility, it's in the name, but to generate waste from, um, sorry, to generate energy from that waste, which we're still doing today, um, to use, to run um, our facilities, the electricity at our facilities and our electric vehicles, and also somewhere around 15,000 homes, depending on any given day. Um, so in the 90s, we started recycling. So it was early 90s when we turned our old um, trash and transfer station where we used to bail up raw trash and bring it to the landfill. We turned that building and kind of recycled it in and of itself into our recycling facility, which we still use today. Um, and we started accepting paper, glass, and metals um, for recycling. And now we, of course, um, have started doing single sort recycling, which happened um, around 2006. We adopted the EcoMain name um, and we started our single sort uh, program, which was the first in Maine. So now we're able to take all of your recyclables in one bin um, and we'll go through the process today to kind of let you know what can go in that bin and what should be recycled in a different way. Um, but the point of single sort recycling was to make it easier for you folks when you're at home to kind of decide whether something is recyclable or something is trash and to make it easier than dividing them out into five different bins. 
Oh, right. So because of all of um, the way that we've evolved here at Ecomain, we have decided to run under the waste hierarchy, which has expanded to be really important in Maine as a whole as well. Um, and what we do here at Ecomain and in, um, in Maine in general is we use the waste hierarchy to decide how we deal with waste. So you guys I'm sure are familiar with the three R's, which are reduce, reuse, and recycle, um, which help us to reduce the waste that we produce and also to kind of take it out of the waste stream in and of itself by reusing it or recycling it and making it into something new, into that circular economy, if we want to talk about that. Um, but we've also added three more um, in addition to the three R's, which are compost and digestion, waste energy, and landfill. Um, so compost is there, so we hopefully are bringing out um, any food waste from our trash facilities, I'm sorry, our um, household waste. And then our waste energy facility is of course allowing us to decrease the size of the amount of waste that we're bringing to our landfill. So that is above landfill because it's helping us reduce the amount of landfill that we're using for the waste that we're bringing to it. So we use the waste hierarchy over here at Ecomain to help support our mission, which is to provide comprehensive long word, long term solid waste solutions in a safe, environmentally responsible, economically sound manner, and be a leader in raising public awareness of sustainable waste management strategies. So before we dive into the recycling process here at Ecoman, I wanted to talk really quickly about what is in your trash and recycling. Um, so in the typical household trash, we have a lot of food waste and organics as we call them. Um, so this would be any sort of thing that would be on your plate and could otherwise decompose in um, a backyard compost or in an industrial compost facility if you're in the Ecoman, um, the Portland area and have a um, curbside pickup for compost. Um, you all also, a lot of times have things that could otherwise be recycled, um, whether through your recycling bin or through a different recycling program. Um, and we also have useful items. So things that could be reused by either yourself or somebody else, um, things that you could throw up on Facebook marketplace to get some money off of, things that you could reuse like picture frames, um, clocks, uh, books are a big one. Um, so all of those usually end up in your trash, but we could divert them from your trash. So when we're looking at recycling bin, we'll go into the specifics of each of these categories, but what should be in there is cardboard, paper, glass, metal, and plastics. Um, plastics is a tricky one. There are some caveats in there, but we'll talk about those and we can dive into any questions if you have them. So um, as we go from here, if you guys have questions about specific items, keep those in the back of your brain because we can talk about those and kind of um, figure out what is and what isn't recyclable if you have certain things laying around that you have wondered about going forward. So keep those in the back of your mind and we'll talk about those too. So to start off here, your recycling journey usually starts off at your curbside. Oh boy. I am going to pause my video here to see if it'll help um, the videos play. So um, as I was saying, your recycling usually starts off at your house or your curbside, depending on where you live and what your community does for waste. Um, so you could bring it to a what we call a silver bullet, which is this container over here on the left, um, where you can deposit all your single sort into one bin. A lot of folks have those um, either at their town office, their transfer station, or another community location. Or you could put it into a bin and have a curbside hauler like this man here in the center um, come and pick it up from your curbside. So um, what this video should be showing you is a dual um, dual composite truck. So it has two different containers on the inside. It looks like it's one container from the outside. So people sometimes get a little concerned as to why their recycling and their trash are going into one truck. But what's really nifty about this truck is this guy in his left hand has a button um, where he is able to open one container or the other, depending on whether he's picking up a um, trash container or a recycling container um, from somebody's curbside. So what this does is allow um, the 
it allows the hauler to stay in the truck. So you don't have anybody hanging off the side of the truck like we used to have. Um, and actually increases the safety for the haulers and also makes it a lot more efficient. So a lot of the, um, a few of the communities around the Portland area have this technology, which is really awesome. It's a lot safer for the haulers and we really think it's pretty neat over here at EcoMain. So once your recycling leaves your curbside, oh boy, here we go again. Um, let me see if I can get these videos to work. Um, so when your curbside hauler or the um, hauler that takes your recycling from your, um, your silver bullet or from your transfer station to us at EcoMain, um, they dump it onto our tipping hall floor. So this um, lower photo on the right is the tipping hall floor. You can see our friend here in the um, green vest. He is con um, estimating the amount of contamination in a load of recycling. So anytime your town brings us recycling, um, we estimate the amount of contamination in it. And when we're talking about contamination, we're talking about things that are not recyclable, but get thrown in your recycling bin anyways. So um, these could be anything from um, your grocery bags from Hannaford. They could be um, just some people throw their straight trash um, bag into their recycling bin, dirty diapers, your samurai swords, some snakes, you know, anything that is in your recycling bin that is really not recyclable. Um, it also could be things that we'll talk about in a little bit called tanglers, like hoses, um, string lights, all of those types of things, um, which are not recyclable, but get thrown in there anyway. So when your curbside hauler um, dumps their load, they are getting estimated the amount of contamination that's in there. And then your town gets, um, a fee when their contamination is really high. So um, if you want to help out your town, reduce the amount they're spending on recycling, you can help us by um, making sure that what you put in your recycling bin is in fact recyclable. So what this video should be showing you here, and I'm going to try and get it to work again. Hey, Lena, um, do you want to switch screen sharing so that, because um, I think I can get it up on my computer. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, sorry. There we go. Hopefully. All right. Are you seeing that okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. I think it should work. Well, there we go. All right. So it's working on my computer. That's great. Um, <laughs> I'm going to mute myself and you can just let me know um, when you want to switch slides. Sure thing. Cool. All right. So our friend here in the front loader, um, is using the machine to get the recyclables onto a conveyor belt. It's a little hard to see because the conveyor belt is lowered in, but we use this tractor type machine to lift up the recycling and put it onto that belt, um, to, which starts the recycling process for us. So as soon as it gets onto that conveyor belt, it get, gets brought to the different areas that we'll show you in the next few videos to um, short out the different recyclables. All right, so the first things that we sort out here at EcoMain are paper and cardboard. So these are the really light, fluffy, and flat things. Um, and to sort these out, we use these stars. So these are the big stars that we use for cardboard. Um, we also have a smaller set of stars that we use for paper. And what you can see is that these um, stars allow things that are light, fluffy, and flat to float right up and over them and allow things that are not light, fluffy, and flat to drop down in the spaces in between the stars. So um, what you can also see is things get tangled in these stars, which is why we can't accept those plastic films um, and tanglers, like I mentioned earlier. So anything that could get stuck in the axles of these um, rotating stars um, is what makes it so that we cannot um, properly recycle. So. Um, we'll talk about that as we keep going, but that kind of contamination is um, inhibiting our processes from happening. 
So these are the smaller stars. Um, you can see here the paper is moving up and over as the stars kind of rotate. And then what you can't really see um, is the plastic paper, I'm sorry, the plastic metals and glasses are dropping through those stars and falling down into the conveyor belt to keep going. So um, we also have here on the left a picture of some folks helping us. Um, so the paper and cardboard, like I said, are the beginning part of the process for us. So in the beginning, we also have a few humans that are helping us out to take trash out of the conveyor belts. Um, and as you can imagine, if we have things that are like snakes and samurai swords occasionally going through our equipment, it's really important that they have a kill switch where they can stop the conveyor belts um, and take out anything that's dangerous. So they're taking out um, really obvious trash, like a trash bag or a um, grocery bag from Hannaford or something like that to um, ensure that the equipment is running properly. And so we'll see here in a little bit that the stars, like I mentioned, get really contaminated and really um, clogged up with things that are not supposed to be in our recycling bin. So when it gets like this, the plastics um, and metals and glasses cannot fall through those stars because the spaces are so small because they're so clogged. So we have to stop the whole plant and um, have some humans climb in and take out all of those tanglers, which you can imagine is a really dirty and annoying job. Um, but we have to do it just about every day, if not a couple times a day, because there's so much contamination that are in our bins. Um, so that just happens and we have to do it. But if we were able to get the community to stop putting those things in our bins, we would likely have to do that a lot less, which would be a huge help for us. All right. So after we have the paper and cardboard sorted out, we use magnets to take out metal. So um, some of the metals, like ferrous metals, so your steel and tin cans and things like that, are attracted to a normal magnet, like your kitchen magnet. Um, and because they're attracted to that kind of magnet, we're able to use a belt, like you could see in this video, to attract those um, to that um, magnet belt and then push it over into a container that's off to the side. So that's a pretty easy way to sort those out. But for non-ferrous metals or aluminum, we can't use that kind because they're not attracted to metals. So what we have to do instead, as you can see in this video, is we have to repel them with a um, reverse magnet or a reverse eddy current magnet that just pushes them away instead of attracting them. Like when you hold two magnets together and they repel away, that's the kind of force that we're using to get aluminum out of um, the recycling conveyor belts and into its own container. So once we have those metals out, we're then able to take the glasses and they get put into an enclosed container um, where instead of having rubber stars like we use for the um, cardboard and paper, we are able to use metal stars to shatter the glass into small um, pieces, almost a little bit bigger than like a dust type, um, but into almost like sea glass types um, sizes. And once we have that crushed up, we take it over to our landfill where it gets stored and then used um, mostly by local companies in um, construction projects. So they can be used as fill, as aggregate, um, and then as road material as well, um, because they're not sharp enough to actually pop a tire or anything, but you wouldn't want to roll around in it. Um, but they can also get used um, to make really pretty countertops, which are actually what all of our countertops here at EcoMain and our kitchens and bathrooms are made out of, which is pretty fun. So now we have the plastics, which as you can imagine, there being so many different products that come in different kinds of plastics can be tricky. Um, so we do a lot of hand sorting for plastics, which I'll mention, but in this video, we'll also play this video again because it's pretty quick, but we use almost like a robot. It's called an optical sorter um, and it identifies number one plastics, which are your pull and spring water bottles um, or your clamshell containers that hold your belly, your berries. Um, and it identifies them with a computer and then sends a puff of air up and under them on the conveyor belt, um, those plastics and shoots them up and over into a container. So if Vanessa wants to play that video again, I'll be able to show you. So this is them identifying um, the number one plastics. Um, and we'll move to the right here in a second in the video and it'll show you the puff of air that's going under the plastics and into the container. So if you look at this metal bar in the back here, you'll be able to shoot, see some pieces of plastic shooting up and over it. 
So at this point, as you can tell from the conveyor belt, the only thing that's on the conveyor is um, other plastic. So after it goes through the optical sorter, we then have a set of humans that are taking out all the other number plastics um, and putting them into different containers by hand. So one person is taking out milk jugs, another person is taking out laundry jugs, um, and so on and so on. And as you can imagine, this is a really um, hard process because you only have a split second to decide what kind of plastic it is. Um, and at the same time, you have to make sure that um, you're putting it into the right container as well. So you also have to have a pretty in-depth knowledge of which kind of container is what kind of plastic. So they have to be very well versed in what plastics are on the market these days um, to make sure that they can do that really quickly. Um, so once they are in their own containers within our plant, we then um, at different times send them through our baler. So this video is showing you um, our baler shooting out some cardboard bales. So we are putting the cardboard through this baler and it makes it into this really tight, compact box almost. So if you guys have watched the movie Wally, -E, this is like a giant Wally -E machine. Um, and our friend here on the forklift is throwing the, the bale around to see how much contamination or things that are not cardboard are in that bale. Um, so you'll see in a minute here, he's going to stop and actually take out some of the contamination that's in that bale. Um, so usually for cardboard and paper, the things that get in there, as you can see that he's tearing out right now are plastic bags um, because they act like paper and cardboard in our equipment. So they act like that light fluffy and flat stuff um, and get mixed in with those things as they go along. So to get from the um, conveyor belt where we had the front loader taking that big load and putting it on the conveyor belt to the baler, it takes about three minutes, um, which is really quick when you think about it to get through our whole plant and to sort out all of the things takes about three minutes. Um, and so once they're in these bales, we use our forklifts and we drive them onto a truck here and they get sent out to manufacturers to make something new out of them. Um, so we don't do any of the making new here at EcoMain, but we are able to give them to manufacturers that will take a certain type of material, whether that be a number one plastic or cardboard and make it into something new. Um, and when you look at the grand scheme of things, recycling is really only part of the process, right? Our main goal, of course, is to get things out of a landfill. Um, and that means making a new life for it in a lot of different ways. So that could be uh, reducing your waste by being able to use something more than once. It could be um, being able to donate something or giving it to somebody else. Um, but it also means being able to invest in um, companies and different processes that are making new things out of old stuff that we already have. So all of those things play a really huge part. And another part, um, we can go to the next slide here. Another part that's really important to think about is using your own dollar um, as a way to promote recycling. So when you're at the store um, or searching online for something new, you wanna look for things that are made out of something recycled. Um, a lot of times now you can find clothes, um, or all of these things that are up here made from recycled materials, which when you invest in those types of materials is showing the manufacturer that you really value things that are made out of recycled stuff, which promotes recycling um, through and through. So as you can see here, we're able to use things like milk jugs to make plastic lumber um, or containers and Frisbees and newspaper to make berry boxes and egg cartons and um, new paper as well. And then a lot of times metal um, is pretty easy to melt down and make into different parts for cars or bikes or usually new cans too. So usually what we find is when we're able to go through the process of recycling and our plant and what equipment we have, it kind of helps folks figure out what actually is recyclable in their curbside bins. But if you still have something that uh, makes you question whether it is or isn't recyclable in your um, household recycling bin, we can do a few things to help you out with that. So if it's a plastic item, we have these three questions that help um, troubleshoot any questions you might have. Um, and they are, if it has a number one through seven on it, we take all um, the numbers one through seven here at EcoMain. So it if it has that recycling, the chasing arrows recycling symbol um, and a number one through seven on it, it is recyclable here at EcoMain. 
Um, it also has to be a container. So a good example of something that's not a container and is not recyclable here at EcoMain would be the lid on your Dunkin' Donuts coffee cup. Um, so that is just part of a container. It's not actually a container of itself. So it is not recyclable here at EcoMain. Um, and then the item has to be rigid. Um, so not easily malleable or crushing, crushable in your hand. Um, so really we're talking about plastic films here. It can't be scrunchy or anything like that when you're having it in your hand, it has to be rigid. So if you're still not sure about something plastic or um, something that's not plastic, like if you have a basketball or a bookshelf or um, a really weird box or a mailer that you got from Amazon and you want to know if it's recyclable or not, you can head over to our Recyclopedia. Um, it's an app on both Android and Apple phones, but it's also a web page. So if you don't have a smartphone or you don't, um, you're not up with the times and using some apps, you can go over to our EcoMain page um, and click onto our Recyclopedia and put in just about anything there. Um, and if we don't have it in our library, we have um, quite a few things, over a thousand at least. Um, if we don't have it in our library, you can shoot us an email pretty easily through the app. Um, and we'll get over and um, able to help you troubleshoot where you can put it. So I wanted to say thank you really quickly um, for joining us here today. And if you, we're gonna jump into questions here in a second. Um, but I also wanted to let you know about ways that you can contact us. So if um, you have a question and you completely forget to ask it and you still wanna know if something is recyclable or not, you can email us at any time and we will get back to you on to whether that is recyclable or not. If you have some other questions not about something recyclable, we'll be happy to answer those too. Um, and you can also find us over on social media where we share recycling tips and um, all of those types of things. So uh, we can open it up to some questions. Vanessa, did we have some in the um, in the comments here? Yes, we do. Um, yeah, so just stop screen share. Uh, we'll do Q and A. So for folks who have questions, feel free to keep putting them in the chat box. Um, but to get you started, Lena, um, two questions coming in about bagged recycling. Um, one is about uh, clear plastic bags for shredded paper. And then the other one is about if you have recycling that is really, really small, um, can you just put it in a paper bag and have it be recycled that way? Um, and, you know, take, take whatever you want and I can, I can take whatever. Um. Sure. So we have one caveat to the plastic bag rule and that is for shredded paper. Um, if you put your shredded paper in a clear, it has to be clear um, plastic bag, we're able to open that up, kind of take it out of the waste stream. Those guys that are um, helping us in the beginning to sort out um, trash, will take that out of the conveyor belt and we'll open it up and put it into um, our recycling piles before they go into the baler. So we're able to take that, but it has to be a clear bag because if it's just um, a normal bag, then we'll just think it's trash and we'll throw it out. Um, and there was another one about- About the small bag. pieces of recycling. Um, yeah, if you want, I can take this one. Yeah. So our rule of thumb at the recycling facility is anything that's larger than uh, the palm of your hand or roughly that size or larger, um, so things like sticky notes, that's about as uh, small as we can really get in the recycling facility. Otherwise, those little pieces are going to fall through the equipment and litter our floor. Um, they make a mess just about every other day with bottle caps and, um, you know, the ring around your milk jug. Um, all that kind of stuff just ends up littering our floor and then um, can kind of leak out in, you know, um, into our area around the facility. So those ones generally are not recyclable. They're too small to recover in the plant. Um, and that question about paper bags, um, one of the concerns that we have with bagged recycling where we can't see the contents is that we really don't know in a split second decision if that is a bag of recycling or a bag of garbage. Um, so it's so I've heard a lot of times people will say if I have my paper shreds and I put them in a paper bag, will that get recycled? And the answer is maybe, um, but if we catch that in the plant and we see a, a brown bag that's full of something, um, we've learned through a lot of um, troubleshooting that a lot of the time, it's about 60% of the time, that's a bag of garbage. Um, and what's inside there is stuff that we can't actually recycle. Um, so generally speaking, we don't want things to be put into bags um, unless it's shredded paper, that's the only exception because then it's confetti if it's, if it's loose. Um, 
but yeah, so that's generally something that we would want you to put in the household trash. Um, if you've got bottle caps or things, you can keep those right on the container and those will get through the plant just fine because they're attached to their, to their original container. So, um, you know, like that salad box or something like that, and you've got a lid that's separated, put them together um, and, they'll, and they'll find their way uh, into the right bin. So the question that I had about the small, it's like Shiba cat food. It's about two inches. It's plastic and it has a aluminum. It's got like a foil top. Okay. Is that too small? It's about um, yeah, around like around the size of the palm of your hand um, is generally okay. That one's probably very close. Um, yeah. And you said it's in a like in a, a plastic or aluminum. It's in a little plastic like dish with a foil top. Okay. Um, I might have to see it just to know and to get kind of an idea on the size. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions coming in, Lena, in the meantime, while we're troubleshooting that yeah. one. So we um, have a um, question about recycling, um, recycling styrofoam. So yes. um, recycling styrofoam is possible, um, but nine times out of 10, it's not um, available at your local recycling plant. So like we don't take styrofoam here um, and most places in the U.S. do not. And it's because of how light styrofoam is. It doesn't make it feasible for us to um to put that into a truck and get it to the recycling facility because it's so light. Um, and if you've ever cut up styrofoam into really small pieces, you know that they're staticky and they stick everywhere and it's a real headache. So um, to actually recycle styrofoam is really um, costly um, and it's not really feasible. So that's another thing that's um, reason why a lot of places have tried to ban styrofoam and those are in the works um, is because of how unrecyclable it is, but it is misleading because they, they try to make you think that it is recyclable. Yeah, one of the problems with plastics is that the, the symbol indicates a resin code. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's recyclable um, at your local facilities. So it's definitely important to check and see what your facility will take. Um, for example, so somebody asked about the nose of paper and I just want to like put in a plug for this card. If you don't have one of these, your town, if you're in an eco main community, you probably can get one of these at the transfer station or, um, or reach out to your public works department or somebody at the town office and they can probably hook you up with some of these. Um, this is our do don't list. I just pulled one out from my drawer here, but it's got all of the a general list of the acceptable materials and then the stuff that we get frequently that's not recyclable. So just looking at this really quickly, it's got things like bubble wrap um, or plastic uh, plastic mailers. Um, it's got styrofoam, even if it's number six is on there too. Um, no needles or sharps, no alkaline button cell or rechargeable batteries, um, no kitty litter, no knives or blades. I mean, you can imagine all of the crazy stuff we get in here. We try to sum it up really well um, and then have a list of resources on the back too. Um, but if we're talking about the nose, somebody asked about the nose of cardboard. Um, I'm just going back through to find that uh, question. Yeah, that, I think that was the first question. Oh, nose that of paper. card is so, available as well online, right? Yes, this is also online. Um, we do have a couple of translated versions. So, um, you know, those are available online and we're hoping to get more soon, which is, which is good so that we can, you know, really distribute this to a broader audience. Um, but yeah, so let's look at the nose of paper to answer that question. Um, so if we're looking at, at this list, um, any waxed paper is not gonna be recyclable in the plant. Um, again, anything smaller than a sticky note is really not gonna get where it needs to go. Um, shredded paper, it needs to be, you know, contained in a clear plastic bag. Um, other types of paper, generally speaking, those things are mostly accepted. Um, we even take things like coffee cups or milk cartons, uh, those ones that are, that are coated in that thin plastic li uh, liner. That plastic um, can be removed in the pulping process. So that is something that we're able to take. Um, I've heard in other, in other municipalities that might not be accepted if they're not sending their stuff to EcoMaine, so just make sure first. Um, you know, there are other towns in Maine that can't accept paper coffee cups um, or milk cartons, but we're able to do it no problem. We've got buyers for that stuff. Um, thermal paper receipts, that's a good question. We, can, we do accept receipts. Um, again, we have to be careful about that stuff because there is like a chemical treatment on those for thermal paper. 
Um, so we want to make sure that that's not all we're recycling. Um, it does get mixed in with our with our single sort, and that's okay. It's not going to be um, problematic in the plant. Another um, paper one that sometimes gets asked about are the um, mailers that are paper on the outside but bubble wrap on the inside. Um, those types of things that are what we call um, like a multi-material. So it's two different materials and one are not recyclable because it's too much material of one to be considered another, if that makes sense. Um, so when you have like, for example, a plastic container that has a little bit of aluminum on it or a little bit of plastic film on it, that's still recyclable because we can take that out. But if it's half and half or three quarters and half, it's not um, feasible for us to remove all of that. So that kind of plastic on the outside or plastic on the inside, but paper on the outside, that type of thing is not recyclable. Um, I think personally, like my choice is if it's mostly one material um, and it's like, so if I'm recycling a, um, like the, the paperboard box that my aluminum foil comes in. So that, you know, I used up all my aluminum foil and I've got that box and it's got a tiny little piece of metal to cut the aluminum foil. It's mostly paper. That stuff going in the paper bale is gonna have very little impact um, on our ability to sell it. It's not gonna be a huge problem. That stuff can be removed. Um, but for like pet food bags that are almost just as much plastic as they are paper, when we go to pulp that, we're not going to get much out of it. We're going to get more uh, plastic out of that equation. So, um, you know, as a like personal rule of thumb for me, um, I want to think about, you know, where is this going to get sorted and what is this material mostly made out of? If it's, you know, like 95% paper and a tiny, tiny layer of plastic on it, that's usually going to be okay. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Linda also had some good comments about things as well. Um, when you are, I believe she had, um, yes, how much um, the town, your town is being charged for unrecyclable items. Um, so that stuff we do, of course, share with the town. We send out monthly reports on contamination, um, which you can um, access. I don't think that most places publish that on their website or anything, but that no, SACO is does. So if you oh, live in SACO, does. Okay. Um, they're very transparent with their contamination fees. Um, and they're very transparent with where they stand. Some of the other towns do publicize them, um, but you can call them and ask. Yeah, They'll, it is they public information. Yeah, so you can, um, but there is, of course, always a lot of work for us to do in the community to make sure that folks aren't recycling their garden hoses and things like that. So um, in most places, there are at least a small amount of contamination um, that we're still working on. Um, and the other um, comment there about um, products, like a list of products that are made of recycled materials, I don't really, so personally, um, I, of course, try to buy things that are made out of recyclable stuff, um, but I have found that there isn't a comprehensive list out there, um, but we could work on making one for sure. Um, and the other thing that is really important, of course, is to um, just, I think the thing about all of um, reducing your waste is about creating a pause for yourself. So bef pausing before you throw something out to really consider whether you could recycle it, reuse it, donate it, et cetera. Um, but also pausing before you buy something to make sure that it's in that right kind of container. Um, um, and even so in the store, if you're going through um, and noting what kind of plastic the container is to make sure that that's recyclable, um, to make sure that you're not going to a local food place if they're still giving you styrofoam every time you buy or what have you. A lot of that falls on the consumer for right now, um, though there are um, things in place to make larger systematic changes to kind of make it, um, take the burden less off of the um, consumer and more onto the manufacturer to make sure that they're creating products that could be recycled um, or making products out of something that is recycled. Um, at this point right now, it is on a large part on the consumer. Um, so it's just another part of being somebody that is, you know, really fighting for um, having a good quality environment and um, all of that. So it's just part of the part of the process, I think, at this point. Yeah. And some and not all materials, regardless of whether we can recycle them or not, they're not all created equally. Um, so, for example, some types of plastics are easier for us to to sell and find homes for than others. Um, for example, right now, three through sevens are not as highly valuable as, um, for example, like number two, which is like your milk jug or your laundry detergent bottle. 
Um, so those types of really durable plastics have really great market value and they hold their value. So when we go to sell them, um, we can get a little bit more money. Um, and again, as a nonprofit and we're municipally owned, that money that we get um, that's you know a, a, above our operating costs, that stuff goes back to our municipalities. So the more we can market and sell our stuff, the more money we can give back to our towns or um, you know the reduction in taxes that you might see um, indirectly. So you know it saves saves us money when we recycle good stuff that's worth a lot and um, that contamination also can kind of ruin the value of material. If there's a lot of trash in our recycling and we can't get it all out, um, then that causes problems for us. And um, so we all have to do our part. It's kind of a collective effort to make sure that that stuff can actually find a home. And um, again, like not everything's created equally. Paper is really easy to recycle for the most part. Um, the markets have been a little tighter since uh, since um, the global markets have shifted. Uh, away from using China as as kind of the primary uh, dumping grounds for a lot of recycling in the in the country and around the world, um, but it's it is easier to find homes for that stuff, um, and things like cardboard are easy to find homes for, um, and and those you know number one and number two plastics are really easy to find homes for, and the metals have been consistent, um, but some of those other types of plastics, especially like the flexible packaging and stuff. Um, if we can make conscious consumer decisions to shift away from those, that's going to be the ideal thing that's going to make the best long-term impact and keep that stuff out of the landfill. We also got a question about crumpled aluminum foil. So as long as your aluminum foil doesn't have like half of your lasagna on it, um, you can be recycled um, in your regular um, recycling bin. So it just has to be like relatively clean. I give it a quick rinse before I throw it in. Um, but yeah, we can sort that out just fine. Yeah. On that question though, up. I just wanted to know the aluminum foil, isn't it going eventually to like a smelter? Mm -hmm. and wouldn't that just burn all that food, you know, sort of debris just get burned off when they're recasting the metal? Or are you worried about like vermin and insects along the way? I'm just wondering, you know, they have to literally like heat that stuff up to like, 500 or a thousand degrees right so I thought that yeah. contamination would burn off yeah that's a good point so um, again it kind of goes back to like my rule of thumb about if it's more recycling than not recycling then it's generally good um, we can deal with a little bit of food residue but what we don't want is somebody throwing their you know aluminum foil with an apple core still inside or pizza crust or something like that so you know egregious food waste and also you know, if you have something that's got like pasta sauce all over it, or you recycle a jar that still has pickles inside, that stuff can, you know, it's going to, it's going to open up in the plant and it's going to release all over a bunch of other things. Um, and it can be, you know, like, again, a, a sanitation issue or, or it might attract vectors. We haven't really seen too, too much of that, but, um, you know, we have some pigeons that like to come and hang out in the plant on occasion and we don't want them digging and scavenging through um, our aluminum foil just to find that lasagna inside so um, so yeah it's kind of a combination of both but they do get smelted um, and that's why we don't care so much about you know a little bit of residue but if it's if it's more food waste and more like crusted on nasty stuff than actual aluminum foil um, then that's when we kind of have a contamination issue issue to worry about that's good because I mean I, I feel like when I wash or rinse things for recycling, I feel more like for the hand, the human sorters, I'm mostly doing it for their benefit. Cause I, I remember somebody telling me once that the energy it takes to bring water to your house and to use the water, you know, if you run the faucet for, you know, 10 seconds to rinse out a yogurt container, that the amount of energy that it takes to get that water in your house. And then of course, the stormwater or the treatment of the sewage water is actually that takes more energy than the energy you're saving from rinsing out the container so i don't know if that is a calculation that someone actually did or this person was just sort of you know sort of guess guessing but that kind of stuff kind of makes some sense right if you spend uh, an hour a week rinsing recycling containers but you're only getting a small energy benefit from it. Is it worth the waste of water? You know, so yeah. I think if, um, Great point. yeah, the the biggest thing for us is um, encouraging folks to 
Um, so if we just allowed anybody to leave um, half like things in, into your recycling, it would kind of get out of hand. So by encouraging folks to clean out their recycling jars, it just allows that to become the norm so that we're not dealing with a lot of contamination of mostly food waste um, and recyclables. Um, but the other thing that I, when you were mentioning that, that I forgot to mention is that if you, um, this is mostly for bottles, um, but if you leave things still in the bottle, so like you have a third of what, third of the water bottle still full. Um, a lot of our processes that we use to sort those recyclables out won't work because we're using things like air um, and lifting that up and putting it into a container with a machine. Um, and if it's heavier than it normally would be, specifically with like a water bottle, a soda bottle, Gatorade bottle, et cetera, um, that puff of air that's supposed to lift that up and throw it into that container won't actually work. So it will end up just essentially in the trash because it's, it's still got stuff in it and it's heavy. Um, Same so, deal goes for the aluminum too, because that reverse eddy current. So if it's, so. if it's too heavy, cause it's got a pizza crust in it, then that kind of projectile is not going to go to the right spot. Yeah. Um, but for us, it's, I think it's more of a focus on empty rather than clean. Yeah. Um, so as long as your containers are empty, um, whether that means you go to town on that jar of peanut butter, um, or you get your dog involved and, and have them lick up the leftovers. Um, we just want to make sure that as much of that, that stuff is empty and the contents are cleaned out. Um, we don't need anybody putting clean, you know, their recycling in the dishwasher. I've heard that from residents before. Um, and like you, like you said, it's a lot of energy to get water. Um, and we don't want to um, solve one environmental problem by creating another. Um, you know, using water is a precious resource and we're saving resources when we recycle, but not at the expense of water resources. Um, so yeah, if it's something that's going to like really stink up your house, like if you don't want, you know, nasty, you know, yogurt in the bottom of your cup, just give it a quick rinse under the sink and dump it out and you're good to go. Um, same deal with your milk jug, because those things, like if you leave a little bit in there, it can spoil and then it's really smelly. Um, you know, this is stuff that's probably congregating in your home for a little while. So if it's, you know, if it's stinky or, or gross, um, that's probably something you want to rinse, but you don't have to, you know, go in there with suds or anything like that. Do you guys have any other questions? What about these? All right, that one, I tend to think that that might be a little too small. Um, it might get where it needs to go, but in in all reality, I'm sure a lot of those might end up on the floor, which is kind of a bummer. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question, I Meg. I have a, a different brand, but the same size tub. So I'm yeah. glad you asked that. I've yeah. been throwing them If they them made them there. twice as big. What about the <laughs> aluminum top that comes off? Um, I would just crumple that up in with a regular piece of aluminum foil if you could. Um, cause then it's big enough and it'll definitely get where it needs to go. Okay. But yeah, I know somebody or asked that about like, different kind of candy. Candy. yeah, that, that's a good example of the consumer choices, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, except, and they sell, um, so nice and small. If you buy cans, you have to, yeah, I know. Black. Yeah. I yeah. actually got, um, they sell lids for the larger containers of cat food yeah. that you can like reuse and reuse. So that's what I've been doing. He doesn't like people. it when it's cold. Oh my <laughs> I know my cat's really picky about that stuff too. And I just put it in the fridge with a, with a cover on it and yeah. he can deal. <laughs> I have to go. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much guys. If, if you have any other questions, we can hang around, but, um, but yeah, thank you so much for dedicating some time to hearing us talk about recycling. I just had, had a question about that. I'm not sure you noticed in the comments about this facility. I don't know exactly how old it is, but at some point we may need to, you know, replace it. So I don't know if there's some kind of mass